This is one of those times that it's really fun, where you take a bunch of little sub-circuits and put them together like little Lego into a bigger circuit. I love it. So as I go through the circuit, it may not make sense to you why I even need this, but trust me, as I do future videos using this circuit, it'll make perfect sense. So for right now, just take my word for it, I have a reason. So the basic idea is that you have a circuit that will have power applied to it and removed to it. So you could have batteries that are inserted, you could have a power switch that's turned on or a plug that's put in, whether USB or wall plug, and you could have that removed or you could have you know, a, a reset button or whatever. So when power is applied or a power interruption stops being an interruption, we have the initial extremely brief phase of the, it's the, the power supply is trying to turn on. It's starting to switch and smooth over. There's surges, there's noise, the power switch is bouncing, whatever. So for a very brief time at the start, everything is haywire. You know, a microsecond, maybe less, maybe a little more. Then we have a boot up period. This boot up period is where the circuit should get ready to run. Now, a complex device like a computer is going to have a microcontroller that does the boot up and it'll be specially engineered to boot up properly. But I'm trying to do circuitry that doesn't need a microcontroller that can run independent of it just for fun or even just to save your pins because you could have a microcontroller with only so many pins and this will mean you don't have to dedicate pins to boot up. Now, a lot of things don't need to be initialized like an oscillator. An oscillator during the initial period is going to be haywire, but once it settles down, it'll just oscillate. There's not really an initial state to it. So if you have some sort of oscillator hooked into your microcontroller, then all you have to do is have the microcontroller wait a certain amount of time and you're good. But if you want to do things like initialize registers, you're either going to have to have your microcontroller do it or have your microcontroller sit there while circuitry does it. Using a microcontroller is going to be smaller because it's one chip with all kinds of logic in it, but it's more expensive and this is interesting. So then you have the run period. This goes forever until power is interrupted, and then you have the drain period. So for my circuit, this is, you know, however long, but it's going to be on the order of microseconds, the, the, the haywire period, so we just ignore it. But we have to remember it's there and don't count on anything. We have to just say, okay, right when we apply power, bleh. And then the boot up period is about a third of a second. And then the drain period is about one millisecond, one, one and a half milliseconds. So the idea of this is you can physically press a reset button and it's definitely going to, it'll bounce a few times probably, but one millisecond, two millisecond is definitely fast enough to drain and get back into the reboot period when somebody presses a reset button, even if they physically press it really fast. So there you go. So I've done videos on many different components of this, and I'm not going to go into full detail on all of them, so refer to those videos. But basically, during the haywire period, just blah, and we don't count on it. For about that third of a second boot up, we're going to have a signal that, you know, haywire, but then it'll be low, and then it'll snap high, and then I'll have a signal like this, and it'll be high, it'll snap low. I've already done that circuit, but in addition, I need a clock signal. So we can't count on an oscillator being ready during the boot up period because first of all there might not be one maybe you don't have an oscillator at all maybe the only oscillator you have is not really a timed oscillator but it's a microcontroller pin that goes high and low manually according to the code like it's advancing a shift register every time the code tells it to or you might be doing something like blinking Christmas lights. So the frequency of the oscillator may be too low, you know, to, to get any reasonable number of cycles in a third of a second. So we need to supply our own oscillator to initialize things that use oscillation because we don't know if there will even be one, how fast it's going. The idea is for this circuit to work with any other circuit, for it to be completely independent and provide these signals. So we're going to have a clock signal initially, whatever, and then it'll be a very fast, very, 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 very fast clock signal. And then here, whatever the circuit needs as an oscillator, if anything, will be plugged in here. So this could be the microcontroller pin for manual operation or the slow oscillator or whatever. And my circuit will automatically switch, use my clock at the beginning, and then it'll just pass through the other clock forever after. So we'll have a signal that is low during boot and high forever after, one that's high during boot and low forever after, and one that is a known regulated clock signal 
during boot and the circuit generated signal thereafter. So the last time I will hopefully mention the boot up period, the haywire period at the beginning, remember to not treat the signal as a clock. You have to treat it as a timer. If you try to say, okay, when the signal goes low to high, I'm gonna treat that as a clock pulse. No, because you're gonna get a bunch of clock pulses earlier on anyway. So you, you have to basically, for that third of a second, whatever the signal is, use it as a steady pulse to just be like, okay, I'm in my state. And you can use the clock signal in combination with it, which I'll show you in the future. So we'll have a single-sided supply, of course. And again, I'm not going to go over the circuit components a lot because I've done previous videos. I'll just review here. So the first thing we have is the timing. This is what is going to generate the slow boot-up signal. Standard RC network, when the capacitor is discharged and power is applied, resistance and capacitance determines when the voltage starts low because the full voltage drop is on the resistor and then it eventually goes high enough that it counts as a high. So this is where the third of a second comes from. I'm using 50 mega ohms for this, so it ends up being, you know, like a second or even more, but once we sharpen the signal up, it ends up being a third of a second. So we have a slow charge, so we need the fast drain, which is just the JFET thing, either a JFET or a depletion MOSFET, because JFETs are depletion by default. And then we have the smaller drain resistor. So we ground the gate, and apply power to the source. When there is power, this is going to make sure source to gate is biased, which cuts the JFET off and prevents the drain. When power is removed, the JFET naturally opens and it drains through, and the diode prevents the JFET from operating backwards and messing up the timing because it should only charge this capacitor through this resistor when power is applied. The diode prevents it from also charging that way. So that's how the fast drain is implemented. So I use a simple CMOS hex inverter to do the sharpening because you have your charging curve is like this, and that's not something we want to use as a digital signal. So we have to turn it into this. And I've done a video on how if you put an RC charging curve into an inverter, the inputs and outputs act as amplifiers. So this curve might turn into this curve and then it turned into this curve. It, it, I can't draw. I can't draw. I can't draw. But go watch the video. It sharpens it up and it turns this curve into a square wave or a square pulse. So I pass it through a single hex inverter five times and then six. So this signal starts low and goes high. So after six inversions, it's no operation. So this output will start low and go high. And then if I take the one after five inversions, it starts high and goes low. So that's the two boot up signals and that's done. So then we can use those two boot up signals. So now I need to generate the high frequency user supplied square wave to use as a clock signal. And I use a simple ring wave generator, so another hex inverter. So in the ring wave generator video, I did five inversions and then used the sixth as a buffer because the ring wave generator signal, if you try to use it directly with something that's not immensely high impedance like a MOSFET input, then it doesn't oscillate properly. It's It, it acts like a pull-up or pull-down resistor, like a, an oscilloscope probe ruins it. So you have to buffer it into itself. You have six, so use the fifth one. It has to be an odd number. I forgot to mention that in the ring wave generator video, but if you have an even number of inverters, then, you know, it's basically no operation, so it's not going to oscillate. So it has to be conceptually one large inverter, where if you put a high here, you should expect a low out here so it keeps circulating. Now, in my testing, the signal is not really sharp enough if you have only three or four, at least with the chips I'm using. I have to go through five inversions to get the signal to be as sharp as I want, which leaves me with this as the buffer, but it occurred to me, if I do put six, that makes better use of the chip because I have a trick up my sleeve. Because remember, I have to switch the clock signal. So another video I did recently is a two to one, basically one bit MUX or digital switch, automatic digital switch between two different input signals using one NAND chip. So basically, I might have signal A be this clock signal. Signal B would be the signal that 
is coming in from wherever, the microcontroller pin, the system oscillator, whatever. It doesn't matter. All we care about is we pass it through after the boot-up period. During the boot-up period, we use ours after we just pass it through. And then we have a switch signal to say, which one are we using? That's the boot-up signal. The one where it's one signal when it's during boot-up and the other signal forever after. So let's say we take this output out of the ring wave generator and bring it down into this NAND gate. So we'll call this signal A the self generated clock. Then we have the boot up signal. So we decided that when the boot up signal is high, we're going to select A, again refer to the previous video, and when the boot up signal is low, we're going to choose signal B. I'm going to call it D, D for direction, whatever, and this is signal A. So we choose the boot up signal because we have both versions. We choose the boot up signal that is high during boot and low after. So during boot we're switching to signal A, after we're switching to signal B. So when A and D are both high, meaning the output of this inverter is high, and then we are during boot. Because when we're not during boot, D is low, which guarantees the output of the NAND gate is high. So if A is high and D is high, the output of the NAND gate is zero. In other words, during boot, when D is high, it acts as an inverter because D high, A high, output is low. D high, A low, output is high. So what I can do is a special little magic trick and take this signal and bring it back here, over here, and I get seven inversions. It's an odd number, so it works as an oscillator. It's a high impedance input, and this is a high impedance input over here we're going to use it in, so it's buffered. It completely utilizes the inverter chip, and it adds an extra propagation delay, so it slows it down a little more, because just five inverters gets a little fast. It's still megahertz, but it's smaller megahertz, so it's not quite as crazy, and it can work with slower chips. So then over here, we have the data signal that we invert with this NAND gate, and then we have the B signal. The B signal is whatever is supplied by the user, by the circuit, whatever. We don't care what it is, we're just passing it through after boot. And that takes D naught. So when D is high, when the boot up signal is high, we're selecting this signal. When the boot up signal is low, we're selecting this signal. And then we pass that into the final NAND gate. And the output here is the output clock. So we need one quad NAND, two hex inverter, the most common chips you'll ever find. I have a box of 100 each, it was like $10. It's crazy. And just imagine the bulk discounts that people manufacturing things get. That was just me as a dude. But anyway, one quad NAND chip, two hex inverter chips, one capacitor, two resistors for the capacitor circuit, one JFET for the drain, and that's it. That's all. And you get a boot up signal, an inverted boot up signal, and a boot up clock. There's one final thing, which is over here, the ring wave generator, I did a video, unsurprisingly, about how the faster a CMOS chip switches, a MOSFET switches, the more power consumption there is. This generator takes like th over three milliamps. That's crazy. However, because of this right here, when the boot up signal goes low, forevermore, this NAND gate will be high, which means this output will always, always, always be high and the oscillation stops. So after the boot up period, there's no more oscillation in the ring wave generator. It sits, all the MOSFETs sit there and take almost no power because of this NAND gate locking when this other signal is there. Because initially I was going to try and use the boot up signal to drive a transistor to cut off power to this, but then I came up with this idea and it automatically does it. It basically turns itself off. So the only extra power consumption thereafter is the fact that whatever clock signal is being passed through is going through an extra, like, like it's, it's switching um, this one. B coming in here and this. So these two NAND gates will still be switching because of the pass-through clock signal. But it's extremely likely that that clock signal is not going to be crazy fast. Because if the only clock in your circuit is, is a crazy fast oscillator, it's going to settle very quickly. You probably have a fancier device that you're going to want something more complex than this to initialize anyway. So I doubt you would be doing this with a fast clock. A slow clock is going to use negligible power, especially if it's a microcontroller pin that's manually switching. So this is a generic circuit that can provide you with all these signals. And I will use it in the future so you see why I even did this. But for now, I'll just show you on the oscilloscope that this works. So here I have a 5 volt supply. 
I love 5 volts because it's standard USB. The oscilloscope is generating a 500 hertz square wave, which so happens to be the standard Arduino output square wave, but it can be anything. This is just an example supplying a square wave to go into the circuit as the one that the circuit is going to use after boot. And it's just a standard 0 to 5 square wave. Right now the power is off, so the oscillator, the oscilloscope, is just basically RF interference driving it through itself. So this is not an actual measurement, this is just the noise, because the circuit is off. So I've got the power switch here, and then I've got two hex inverters and one quad NAND. I've got five 10 mega ohm resistors for a total of 50 mega ohms, which is handy because what do you use 10 mega ohm resistors for anyway? I forget the capacitor, hold on. If I remember correctly, it's a 10 nanofarad capacitor, and the drain resistor is 27 k ohms, and I'm just using whatever JFET and whatever diode, it doesn't really matter. And that's the whole circuit. The entire circuit would obviously be more compact with, you know, traces on a board. And the final thing is I have my multimeter here measuring current. Right now there's no current because the power is off. But this is just measuring the draw from the power supply. Every single thing, every single chip. Now it's because it's not, the chips are not being supplied and just the signal cut off. Literally the entire power supply is going through the one switch. So on boot up, every chip boots up, the JFET boots up, everything boots up. To demonstrate this is literally how it would work with power connected. So when I turn power on right now, because it's, it's already booted up because it's a third of a second. So here is the square wave. If I press measure, we see it's 500 hertz. So this square wave is being put through. The oscilloscope is measuring the signal being generated by the circuit. And here we can see, if I go to microamps, and as you can see, it's only 185, 186 microamps powering all the chips and switching at 500 hertz. If I turn the wave generator off, it's still about 185, but now it's not going to 186. Now it's going between 185 and 184 to the limit of this basic multimeter to measure. This indicates to me that the switching alone, and if I turn it back on, it goes back up to 185, 186. So it seems that the power loss from passing through this signal is about one microamp. Because the, the power draw of actually generating the signal, that's the only thing not going through the power supply. So the extra microamp is just from the switching. So something like this is not that bad. So now let's pay attention to the boot up. So when I first turn it on, watch closely the multimeter. And it only updates like once every half second, so it's difficult to really see what's going on. But if you watch the power supply, you can see the power supply went up to six and it updates a little faster. When I was demonstrating this earlier in the other video, when I was seeing about six on the power supply, I was seeing about three point something on the multimeter. So let's assume three to four milliamps, closer to three during boot up, but only 180 some microamps during runtime. So now I'm going to turn the power on and quickly hit pause on the oscilloscope so we can see the signal. So now I turn the power on, it's already finished booting up, but I hit pause while the signal was still being passed through. And if I hit measure, this is just a smidgen under three megahertz. It's 2.9 megahertz something. So this is the square wave that's being generated by the ring wave generator. And you look at this from a human standpoint, this does not look very sharp, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty curvy. But if we look at the actual duration of the curve, right now the divisions are 72 nanoseconds. So it goes down to up, it goes up to down on the order of 50 to 100 nanoseconds. So this is just an illusion. This is about as sharp as you're gonna get. This is basically how fast the chip can even switch itself. So once you're on the range of nanoseconds, low 100 nanoseconds, that is sharp. That is a square wave because nothing is ever literally instantaneous. So the signal does work. So now as a final demonstration, here it's on, it's finished booting up and here's the square wave being passed through. If I turn power off, we get nonsense, just inducting through parts. And then watch closely as I turn it on. You see how it was basically a solid yellow box? Let me do that in pause. So I 
turn it on and pause, and this solid yellow box is the high frequency square wave. If I zoom in, now, you know, it's lower resolution because I captured when it was zoomed out, but that's the high frequency square wave. And then if I unpause, here's the low. So that's what's happening here. You can see, da 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 da, and there you go. And this is the magic spell I have come up with to be able to initialize any chip within reason, including a clocked chip like a clocked shift register without any microcontroller. If you want to do it the easy way, get another microcontroller. And if you have the money to spend, you get a box of 328 or whatever, or use an FPGA, or not an FPGA, I mean you could, but use something like a PLA or a PLD. You can use whatever you want, but I think using something as simple as basic logic chips and discrete components to initialize full-on logic chips can be really cool. But for now, I'll be seeing you.